So on uh, April 19th, 1995, I was a baby attorney. It was my very first job out of law school. Um, I was a staff attorney for a sentencing commission, and we were located in the Journal Record building on the south side of the building, uh, I believe about 120 feet um, from the bomb when it went off. Uh, so I was at my desk, and uh, I was actually reading criminal statutes, which is what you have baby lawyers do, uh, is kind of grunt work. And uh, so yeah, I was sitting at my desk when, when that happened. For me, you know, my first thought was just that something evil had happened. Um, I, I've i heard people say they thought it was a natural gas explosion or, you know, all kinds of things. But for me, I just had a sense of evil. And we were so close to it um, that actually the, the impact of the bomb uh, travels faster than sound. And so for, for me, I was just sitting at my desk and then all of a sudden all my hair blew straight up. So I, I took the wind um, and then the ceiling caved in and the walls and all that, but you never really heard anything because we were too close to hear it. I was not injured physically. Um, I was the only one in my office who didn't go to the hospital. Um, we had several that were injured. We had several in our building and that were, you know, permanently disabled. I had a coworker who took the majority of the um, window to her face and, you know, she just kept screaming and, you know, trying to get to her and everything was full of smoke and debris. And I mean, nothing looked the way it did before. Um, I remember going to the window and because we were on the south side of the building right above the survivor tree. And I remember going to the window and thinking that I could climb out of the fire escape and um, to get out of the building. But in a bombing, the fire escape is blown off the building. And so at one point I thought I was going to have to jump and we were on the third floor. But then the cars started exploding in the parking lot underneath and you know so I realized that wasn't gonna work but it was um it was really hard to get out of the building it was it was really hard it was a really old building um I only came in and out of the building through the elevator which in a bombing you don't have elevators anymore because they're sucked out and um, and so we hadn't practiced you know how to get out of a building I didn't know where the stairs were um so it was very difficult. Um, sorry. <laughs> There's still a lot of it I don't remember. <laughs> so, you know, anytime you have something like that happen, and especially at such a young age. I mean, I was 25, my very first job. I was actually hired on January 19th, 1995, for my very first job. So three months into my career, um, to have something like that happen just out of nowhere. Um, and, you know, the world was, was so different then. That's part of the challenge of the memorial is to you know, carry on the story, but to this younger generation, it, it's hard for them to understand the context. We hadn't had school shootings at that point. We hadn't had 9-11 at that point. I mean, the society was just so different that it was really um, out of nowhere. For me, I was, um, I was in shock for about three days. And um, my grandfather, who was a World War II vet, ended up coming up to see us that weekend. And he told my mom, you need to get her to someone. She has shell shock, which is what, you know, they called it in World War II. We had a lot of people that worked in the office that weren't there that day. 
And so they were in meetings or, you know, various things. And so it was hard. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons on kind of what not to do. Uh, so a week after the bombing, they had us back in the building to retrieve whatever belongings we could. Um, for those of us who were there that day, going back into the building probably was not a great idea. Um, for those who hadn't been, you know, maybe it was because they could see, you know, what we were dealing with, but that was kind of re-traumatizing again, in a way. My mom went with me, which was wonderful, but um, I mean, they were still recovering bodies, you know, out the window and you're in there trying to piece together files. Um, and, you know, everything's everywhere. Uh, they retrieved what they could. They relocated us um, to another building and just, you know, kind of boxed up what they could. And so you would open those boxes and they you would smell like ceiling tiles and fuel. And I mean, it just was just, and there, everything was full of glass and you had papers with blood on them. And it just was not, um, you know, it just, it, it went on um, for quite a while uh, to try and regroup. They took a lot of fertilizer from our computers and, you know, I mean, it was just, it was, it was a lot. Um, I was, I was very lucky uh, early on and, you know, trying to take that energy and use it in some way. And so one of the first issues I actually ended up tackling was my coworker um, was out of annual leave and was out of sick leave. And they were getting ready to start docking her pay. Um, well, that just didn't make any sense to me that you could have somebody who had been in a bombing on the job and that that somehow was counting against her. And so we worked with then Governor Keating to create what's now called administrative leave. Um, that's something that's still in place in state government to this day. But so now you can use administrative leave if there's an ice storm or there's a tornado or something that is kind of outside the realm of you as an employee taking vacation or sick leave. So I was very lucky to do that. Um, I also got involved with a group of family members and survivors who worked on the very first anti-terrorism legislation. And so again, that was just an incredible opportunity to come together and to use our anger and frustration and hurt and energy to try and move things forward. Um, we worked on habeas corpus reform. At the time when we started, we didn't even know who had done it at that point, nor that they would get the death penalty. Uh, but the habeas corpus reforms we put in place actually many years later ensured that Timothy McVeigh was executed in a timely fashion because of the legislation we'd worked on. Um, we put in place the first anti-terror, the first terrorism legislation that ever existed in the country. We partnered with the families of Pan Am 103. Um, and I learned it was, it was interesting from somebody who works in public policy, the far, far right hated the bill and the far, far left hated the bill, uh, which I've learned usually means it's pretty good legislation uh, over my career. So that was an, an incredible opportunity to see a group of people come together and work within our system of government to change the laws and, and to react to a problem that was in our government. The very thing that Timothy McVeigh was working against, we were fixing within our system of government. I think, I think the bombing has impacted the city and the state in, you know, so many ways that if you were here and if you were old enough, you can see it. Uh, but, you know, almost 60 percent of the people who live in Oklahoma City today were not here in 1995. And so they don't have the benefit of, of hindsight. They don't remember what it was like when the boathouse district was a bar ditch that you mowed. Um, they don't 
remember, you know, the skyline before the Devon Tower was here. And I, I think what the Oklahoma City bombing demonstrated, the Oklahoma standard is for real. That, I remember, you know, there were so many people who came in. I mean, this had never happened. No one thought something like this could happen, and certainly not in some place like Oklahoma City. I mean, the epitome of flyover country. And when it did, and we came together, and we responded in such a way that was so admirable. I mean, there was there was not any looting. There wasn't any crime. There, the things that we did instinctively as a community, bringing our churches together to figure out how to support people, bringing our nonprofits together to figure out how what to do with the funds that that were coming in, putting together counseling services. I mean, those were things that there weren't plans for that we as Oklahomans just instinctively did as the right thing to do. That is now how you, that is the standard of how you respond to a mass casualty event. And we just did it because of who we are, being resilient people. And we didn't, we didn't do it to, to show off or to prove to people that's just what you do as an Oklahoman. You help your neighbor, you help one another, and you fix the problem and you get through it and you get through it with faith and, and by leaning on one another. And that's what we did. And I think seeing it just continued to instill that pride and sense of community and, and sense of togetherness that led us to continue to support MAPS and the, the growth of downtown Oklahoma City and that we were the kind of community that could have an NBA team and we were the kind of community that could have an Olympic rowing facility. Like if we're capable of responding to one of the most horrific events to ever happen in that way, what else are we capable of? And I think 25 years later, we've proven that. And we should be proud of, of who we are and how we've responded. That's part of why the memorial exists. It's not just to remember what happened, and that's important, and to remember those lives that were lost, but it's also to remember how we responded and, and what kind of people we are that we live with hope and we live with resilience and we demonstrate it every day. The, the Memorial Museum is, is important to continue to remember what happened and to continue to remember the lives that were lost. It's important to tell the story. I have two sons that are teenagers, you know, and we run the, the marathon, you know, as a, that we started in kindergarten and they ran the kids marathon every year. And I would bring them down and show them mommy's name on the survivor wall and tell them the story of what had happened. And, you know, each year it became, as they would get older, I would tell them a little bit more of the story. I still haven't told them all of it, but um, so that they could understand and know that that's part of who they are, and part of their history. But it's important to continue the lessons. Violence and hate has consequences. And even today, those lessons are relevant. There were people who knew that was gonna happen and didn't say anything and didn't do anything and didn't stop it. And they had the ability to do so. That's a lesson that our next generation needs to learn. Violence and rhetoric. I mean, you think of our country today and how divided and polarized and the, the chatter, like we know where that leads. It's a different, between the First Amendment and free speech and the level of hate and the level of rhetoric. We know where that leads. These are lessons that continue to need to be taught, that there are consequences. And when you talk about government and bureaucrats, those are people. Those are people who have children or who have parents, who have brothers, who have sisters. And there's 168 of them that are no longer here we have to continue to tell those lessons and that's what the memorial does.